Uh, we can see everybody is uh, logging in now. We just give it a minute. This is always the interesting part when you see everybody just logging in slowly and you're looking at the numbers, like your eyes are just locked on the numbers, looking at the number of people coming into the room. Um, but yeah, I guess uh, without further ado, uh, uh, salam alaikum everyone and uh, good evening, uh, good morning, good afternoon, wherever you're uh, logging in uh, from. Uh, my name is Omar al Saidi from the UAE consulate here in New York. Uh, thank you for joining us today for this special discussion on advanced technology in renewable energy. Uh, the UAE is committed to climate action and creating a low carbon future globally, which is why we have joined the diplomatic community today to host a day of virtual discussion in celebration of Earth Day. In this hour, we will hear from world experts and leaders in the field of renewable energy on how they are tackling the critical demand for advanced clean technology. With that, it gives me great pleasure to introduce to, uh, to all of us, uh, our panelists and moderator. We are joined by two leaders in the UAE, His Excellency Yusuf Al Ali, uh, Assistant Undersecretary for Electricity, Water and Future Energy Sector at the UAE Ministry of Energy. Thank you, Your Excellency, for joining us. Dr. Dalia Al Muthanna, President and CEO of GE Gulf. Um, I did, introduce, I did say one thing that was interesting that Dr. Dali and I went to the same university, so I'm honored to have at least that connection. We were both uh, alumni from uh, the American University in Dubai. Uh, from Israel, uh, our uh, cousins, uh, Yusuf uh, Abramowitz, president and CEO of Energia uh, Global Capital. And uh, you should all know that he's also wearing a green kippah on, uh, to celebrate uh, Earth Day, so you can see that. Uh, looks pretty cool. I thought I was kind of cool with my blue outfit, but obviously he looks much better. And, um, and from the US, uh, Andrew Cricken, uh, Senior Advisor at the Water Center at University of Pennsylvania, uh, UPenn. Uh, thank you for joining us. And the discussion will be moderated by Andrew Hordern, uh, Vice Consul of Prosperity, Economic and Climate Policy at the British Consulate in New York. Uh, thank you all for joining us. We have two Andrews and two Yusufs and uh, our Dr. Dahlia with us. Andrew, uh, over to you. Thank you. Thank you very much. And let me, let me just start off by thanking the uh, Consulate General of the UAE in New York for setting up this event. It's really wonderful. To, uh, it's just fascinating looking at our panel. We've got people from all over the world and all these different viewpoints coming in to have this discussion. It's really, really great to be part of this. Now, just to, let's just give it a little bit of context here. So 20, now 2021 is a major year for climate initiatives. This week, President Biden is holding his climate summit, bringing together world leaders to increase climate action. This will be an important stepping stone in the lead up to November 2021, where the UK, in conjunction with Italy, will host the UN Climate Change Summit, COP26. COP26 will be an inclusive summit where we'll be asking countries, businesses, states, and civil societies to come forward with enhanced climate goals. But how are we going to achieve these enhanced climate goals? You need the technology to make this whole system work. So that was, that's what brings us to today's panel. So I think that this is a really fascinating topic and we look forward to digging into it. So as a starter, could I please ask His Excellency to talk for a few minutes about uh, the UAE's plans in terms of moving forward with this agenda. Thank you, Andrew. I think uh, I'm always passionate when I talk about uh, renewable energy and advancement in, in technology. And uh, I'm proud with what UAE achieved over the last years. Let me take you through the history of, uh, of the UAE when it comes uh, to renewable energy. So UAE in 2006 was uh, probably one of a uh, small number of countries that announced targets when it comes to renewable energy, and probably the, the first country in this part of the world that announced renewable energy targets. In 2006, we announced 7%. If you look today to what we achieved, Today, so far, we have almost uh, committed capacity, renewable energy capacity. When I say committed, I mean under construction. We have almost 12% uh, 
power capacity is from renewables, mainly solar. And we have another 12% under construction that comes from nuclear. So the total percentage of our clean energy share Today, we are heading toward 24%. This itself a huge achievement for the UAE. When you go deeper and uh, look at uh, how we achieve this and how, what kind of innovation we have uh, through our journey when it comes to renewable energy. Let me focus on renewable energy. In 2008, we signed our first agreement for the first uh, photovoltaic plant that was built in Mazdar City, 10 megawatt. And we signed also the agreement for the first concentrated solar plant. At that time, these plants were the biggest in the region. So no other similar plant. The concentrated solar plant that we built in Abu Dhabi at that time was the first plant to be built in a desert environment. Going Beyond these two plants, we had many benchmarks. UAE became a benchmark when it comes to size of renewable energy projects, size of renewable energy plants, and the economics. So we have many benchmarks that we set through our journey. Speaking about uh, phase two of Sheikh Mohammed Barashid Solar Park, the price at that time was around 5.9 cents per kilowatt hour. It was an, an international track record, international benchmark for pricing when it comes to solar projects. Then going after to phase three of Sheikh Mohammed Barashid, 2.99 was the lowest worldwide. Going after that to Noor project, another mega project in Abu Dhabi where we achieved almost, uh, it was around 2.4 cents per kilowatt hours. All this now, uh, just recently, we announced a Bafra project, 1.3 uh, cents per kilowatt hours. So a lot of innovation that allowed us, uh, technological innovation and financial engineering innovation that allow us, allowed us to use this uh, benchmarks. So we have uh, really a, a program that we are proud of and we continue to achieve step by step. Another thing that I want to highlight beside the renewable energy, uh, the renewable energy program, we also use different technologies that is unique to this region. So we were one of the first who adopts uh, storage technologies. And when I talk about storage technology, molten salt technology, we are building a molten, huge molten salt technology in Dubai for the CSP projects in Dubai for the solar concentrated solar. We are one of the first who use battery storage system to stabilize the grid here in Abu Dhabi. Beside that, we also built other technologies that reduce other, other uh, technologies and plants that reduce our carbon emission. I can highlight the carbon capture plant, the first commercial carbon capture plant to be built, a Riyadh project operational since 2015, captures around 800,000 tons of CO2 that get transferred via pipeline and used for enhanced oil recovery. I can mention also the waste to energy projects that we are building, one of the first in the regions where we are almost, uh, we are eliminating around 2 million tons of uh, municipal waste from, from, from the environment, thus reducing the emissions, reducing the methane that will be produced uh, out of these, uh, out of these projects. So a lot of achievements when it comes to the generation side, a lot of innovations, technological diversity, and we are also now looking at our demand side management. We just announced recently our national demand side management uh, program. The demand side management program targets to reduce our electricity consumption by almost 30% by 2050 and to reduce our water consumption by almost 50%. This program tackles all the economical sector. We're talking about building, we're talking about industrial, we're talking about agriculture, we're talking about even food, food industries, a program, a diverse program to reduce our uh, to be more efficient. So UAE achieved a lot when it comes to uh, generation and when it comes to adapting renewable energy and adapting new technological. We were always, uh, I would say, the first mover when it comes to this direction. Since 2006, we were the first nation, oil producing nation, that announced such 
uh, ambitious program for renewable energy, for clean technologies, for uh, emission reduction technologies. That's it, Tando. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much, His Excellency. I mind if I actually have a follow-up question in relation to that. It's like through this through this work and the UAE's Energy Strategy 2050, um, it really you really outline the efforts as an oil producing country to embrace renewable technology. Do you have any advice for other uh, oil producing countries and how to take a similar path? Andrew, for uh, in our energy strategy for 2050, we target to achieve around 50% of our energy to come from clean sources. And, uh, you know, considering where we are today, I think uh, UAE will definitely overachieve, uh, we will overachieve this target. And along with this target, we aim to reduce our carbon emissions by 70%. So it's a huge target that we want to achieve. Uh, I think UAE sets a good example for uh, uh, energy leaders, for oil producing countries. We look at ourselves as a major producer of energy, major producer of uh, exporter of energy. The map of energy is changing. This is a fact that nobody can stop it. So renewable energy is playing an important role. Uh, climate change issues is really influencing decisions around the world. And for us to keep our environment clean, to keep our economy healthy and growing, and to maintain our leadership position when it comes to be one of the most important exporters of energy, I think we need to diversify also and, and uh, enter into renewable energy, enter into nuclear energy, enter to all, all, all kinds of, uh, of, of, of energies. Thank you very much, His Excellency. Uh, Fascinating stuff. There's so much we can dig into there, and we will definitely do that as we move forward in terms of this. But at this stage, I'd like to introduce the rest of our panel. Dr. Dahlia, um, in your role, um, you develop localized business strategies for GE's industries, including power and renewable energy. How is GE responding to the call for greater climate action, and how you will implement this in your business strategies? Thanks, Andrew. Thanks for the question. And it's always energizing to hear, you know, the, the amount of work that the UAE really has put in this field. It's, it's really impressive. Um, you know, in, as part of GE, we believe that climate change is an urgent priority. And as a company, we are uniquely positioned to play a key role through its scale, breadth, and technological depth. As a company that powers one third of the world's energy, GE is positioned to help this greater call for climate change. Um, and we're taking aggressive actions to deliver global solutions and to develop and deploy innovative technologies to drive the deepest carbon reductions in the quickest amount of time. Um, we have been a key player in the power industry since its inception and have a suite of complementary technologies, including gas-fired power, onshore and offshore wind, hydro, small modular nuclear reactors, battery storage, hybrids, and grid solutions needed for the energy transformation. Now, around mid-December, we actually released a white paper on our position on climate change. It's around 20 pages that calls for accelerated deployment of renewables and gas power to drive impactful, faster decarbonization. So I invite all of you and the audience to uh, go onto GE's website and download the paper. Uh, it's a great read. On the business strategy side, our journey towards decarbonization basically calls for strategies that are relevant and effective to specific uh, geographies. So it's not, a, it's not a one size fits all approach. Um, decarbonization actions will be determined locally based on resource availability, policy, current infrastructure, and demand uh, for power. Uh, we look at cutting emissions while still meeting the needs of the communities around the world for power, healthcare, and transportation. Um, G as a company is committed to supporting decarbonization goals as we believe that the change actually starts with us. So in mid-October last year, we announced a goal to achieve carbon neutrality within our own operations by 2030. This is one of our uh, climate commitments and a demonstration of how G is rising to the challenges of energy transition. Basically, that commitment covers more than 1,000 facilities around the world um, and will focus on new operational investment, waste elimination, and smart power sourcing. In fact, we surpassed our own emission reduction goals from our operations for 2020 ahead of schedule in 2019. Now, one thing I do want to highlight here is the importance of the advancement of technology. You know, obviously, climate change cannot be solved without substantial advancements in technology. 
And as a company that's been innovating for around 120 years, we're deploying GE's global reach, expertise and depth of engineering to address this challenge. And just briefly, maybe I'll just take a minute here to share some of the greatest uh, breakthroughs in GE's technologies. Renewables have been the fastest growing source of new power generation uh, capacity. And we have one of the broadest portfolios in onshore and offshore wind. Uh, the wind energy sector last year, we became the world's largest wind turbine manufacturer and installer. Uh, in onshore wind, our two megawatt onshore wind platforms are, is approaching 20 gigawatts of install base globally. And in offshore wind, GE's Halide X turbine, which operates at 13 megawatts, is the world's most uh, powerful offshore and wind turbine. And we continue to develop nuclear technologies, uh, including advanced reactor natrium technology, which is jointly developed with our partner, Terra Power. Um, and I, you know, one thing what I just want to like to close out with that uh, the growth of renewables in context of the future forecasted power demand, you know, renewables alone wouldn't be able to cover the need. And hence uh, our view is that gas power, including natural gas and hydrogen, will be a force multiplier to help accelerate decarbonization. Um, and on, on that note, I do want to say that GE's uh, HA turbines, which have set a world record in their efficiency, um, are engineered to complement variable renewables with their flexibility, in addition to having the capability to transition to 100% uh, hydrogen over time. Thank you, Dr. Dahlia. I can say that those 13 megawatt turbines do get a lot of press over here in the US. We, we've heard an awful lot about them in terms of their work. Definitely cutting edge technology going on there. I'll just uh, turn on to Mr. Abramovitz. Um, so pioneer in terms of the solar work going on in, in, in a lot of these different places. Can you talk about your role in developing the solar in, industries in Israel and Africa and how technological advances are helping the solar industry? Hey, thank you. Uh, Salam Aleikum, Ramadan Karim. Deeply honored to be uh, on this panel and to be celebrating uh, Earth Day together. Um, and it is a historic uh, Earth Day, uh, as you mentioned, President Biden, and also in the um, wonderful aftermath of the Abraham Accords. Uh, it's, good, it's good to be together. Um, so before I talk about Israel and uh, Africa, I want to talk about the, the role of UAE in, in the development of my solar journey. Because um, I was, uh, I think, the lone Israeli at the founding of Mazdar at the uh, World Future Energy uh, Summit. And the first solar field that I ever visited and got to walk through was not one that I built. It was the 10 megawatt, Your Excellency, uh, um, Mr. Yusuf, it was your field. Um, and I, I came very inspired from those uh, encounters because you guys do dream big. Um, and in Israel, the, the first goal was, could we create the first region in the world um, from the Red Sea to the Dead Sea to be 100% daytime solar powered and then 100% night and day. That was, that was the task before. Because, you know, as you know, we all need to accelerate e even above the, the worthy targets that we've discussed here. I think we all have to revisit and, and, and up the ante the way President Biden is about to tomorrow. Um, and so we, we set about uh, to do that. And also, as His Excellency said, Building in the desert environment requires innovation. Uh, we had to develop the first uh, solar powered uh, water free robots to deal with the dust storms after the Sharab storms. Um, uh, we've had algorithms and, and now we're solving for storage uh, without batteries, without rare minerals through compressed air uh, and, and other things. I'm really pleased to say, oh, I'll tell you two things. One is I wish the Israeli government had higher targets and took this as seriously as, as I think the leadership in UAE is taking it. And we, you know, we've had a, our own political uh, issues lately, so it's hard to take decisions. But even in the context of that, I want to say that the southern part of Israel, the Wadi Araba, we're already a full year at 100% daytime solar for the port city and all the communities and the factories and the hotels. And by 2025, it will be 100% night and day. And what this means is that it's possible, technically feasible, financially advantageous uh, to be able to do so. And so we've taken that model now to Africa. Uh, and in Africa, we're, we're, we're essentially uh, undermining diesel, right, and heavy fuel oils, which are very expensive and very polluting. 
Um, but no one had ever succeeded in sub-Saharan Africa. And we built a solar field in Rwanda. It's, uh, we plugged it in, supplying 6% of its power. And I'm really pleased to announce that we're uh, plugging in right now a solar field in Burundi that will supply 15% of the generation capacity of a, of, of a poor country. So it's not only technology, and I, and I really wanna say that um, I, th I, I think this is first and foremost about vision, about moral leadership in a world that is heating up and that the consequences are likely to be catastrophic and that joining forces together now technologically with investments, um, we just put in for a bid with a UAE partner in a West African country for a solar installation. And I think really by joining forces and, and upping the ante um, that between our combined um, uh, commitments to innovation and your, your ability to finance more than our ability to finance, but this is a partnership that I think can literally save the world. And we're looking forward to working together. Thank you very much, Mr. Rum. It's fascinating hearing about your work in Africa and the and the good positive sentiment, which is what we want uh, the whole whole work on environment leading up to COP twenty six. The positive uh, thing: how can we move things forward? Last but not least, because uh, because definitely he shares the my fellow Andrew Andrew Crichton. I'd just like to turn turn to you in terms in terms of your work. Fascinating uh, pioneer work in terms of water technologies in terms of what he goes on. Can you talk about how your organization, Moonshot Methods, works to develop technologies to improve access to drinking water? Absolutely. Thank you. First of all, it's, it's a great honor to be uh, included in this panel and to have heard the great work that uh, my colleagues on this panel have, have been doing. It's, it's encouraging and inspiring. And um, I'm so glad and grateful as an, Amer as an American that the United States has rejoined the US uh, Climate Change Accords. It was very disappointing to me personally that we had dropped lapsed, um, but I'm, I'm grateful that the new direction that our country is going in. And uh, because I agree with what's been said here, that the issue of climate uh, change is, 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 is literally uh, a, a battle to, sa to save the planet and to save, uh, save the world. So I think that everything that you're all doing and that, that we all can do together is critical. And that will be the, the story of mankind that we write in this century will be about whether or not we succeeded in, in doing what was necessary to save the planet and to deal with this climate problem. Um, the water and wastewater sector is, is, is no different. Um, we are very, uh, obviously it's, it's important for, for public health and the environment to provide safe drinking water and clean waterways, but we're also very big energy users. Uh, in the United States, the water and wastewater industry accounts for about 4% of all the United States energy usage. So obviously, Anything that we can do to reduce our energy usage, independent of other factors, will make a difference with respect to uh, global warming and reducing carbon footprint. So that's important in and of itself. A second factor with respect to climate change is, is the more severe storms and therefore the greater vulnerability of water and wastewater treatment plants to be put out of service. And just for example, um, in my home state, uh, which is the state of New Jersey, uh, not so far from New York, um, we had a, a very significant storm back in 2012, in which many of the wastewater treatment plants were taken out of service for a long period of time. And as a result, billions of gallons of untreated sewage went into the waterways of the, uh, you know, the, the receiving waterways in, in the vicinity. Also, the recent storms in Texas, you know, left people without drinking water for a period of time. And of course, there have been storms in, in Puerto Rico and Florida, Houston, et cetera. So the need for resiliency is, is um, you know, very clear. And, and for those who, who don't believe in climate change, um, you know, all they have to look at is climate history and see that the nation's infrastructure is inadequate to how the climate already is. And of course, we expect that to, to worsen. So it's critical from a standpoint of resiliency as well as carbon footprint reduction to make sure that our water and wastewater utilities are resilient as possible. Um, and so, and lastly, uh, doing the right thing is also doing the smart thing because in many cases, implementing projects like this can actually reduce energy usage and reduce costs. So for example, there's basically a, a sort of a two-pronged approach that water and wastewater utilities are taking uh, across the nation to try to reduce their carbon footprint, improve their resiliency, and also save money as well. The first, of course, is energy consumption reduction, energy efficiency. The best electron is the one that you don't use and the one that you don't need. And so, um, for example, um, 
wastewater treatment plants are, 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 are relying more on, say, gravity. In some instances, you can get gravity to do something that you use power to do. So by optimizing your treatment facilities, op optimizing your, your pumping, you can actually reduce the energy usage and, and still convey and treat at the same level. Uh, then, of course, there's green energy options. Um, the wastewater treatment plant that I used, we were, uh, that I used to operate, we, used, we completely got off the grid by reducing our energy consumption by 25%. By putting in a two megawatt solar panel array to, to provide some electricity, and then by converting uh, this, the biosolids of the wastewater the, from the wastewater, digesting it, turning it into a biogas, which then could be converted into electricity, and so the plant could actually run on its own sludge and solar. And so, therefore, if there's an electric power outage in the community, the treatment plant will still continue to run. And that can be taken even further, um, and. Uh, his Excellency alluded to the idea of food waste coming into wastewater treatment plants. Food waste can actually be used so that the plants can actually be a net generator of electricity and form a microgrid of, of resiliency for the community it serves. So the, the, the plant can actually generate more electricity than it, than it needs and have spare electricity so that on a blue sky day, it can provide lower cost electricity to underserved, you know, uh, like low income households, so at lower cost. But on a black sky day, when, there's, when there is a power outage, it can be the backup for hospitals, police, fire, jails, you know, critical infrastructure that has to be running at all times and, and be a net provider. So it can save money for low income households during the blue sky day, but I'll, I'll be a, a backup power, source of power for critical infrastructure when there's a power outage. So in this way, we can reduce our carbon footprint, increase our own resiliency, but also our community's really resiliency through this microgrid approach. And then lastly, we reduce costs as well because the green energy is, is uh, more, more cost effective. Be um, very pleased to see that President Biden talked about putting in $111 billion for water infrastructure in the upcoming infrastructure bill that's being discussed. Much We hope that some of that will be go, going for this water energy next to take advantage of the opportunity to improve the resiliency of our water and wastewater treatment plants because we, none of us can do without safe drinking water and clean waterways, but also provide this opportunity for green energy as well. And in that way, you know, the United States can help to you know, do its part with respect to climate change. Um, the U United States Environmental Protection Agency, I'll, I'll close with this, the United States Protect Environmental Protection Agency, the Water Environment Federation, and the National Association of Clean Water Agencies, and the Water Research Foundation have all joined together um, to try to transform the water and wastewater sector in our country by creating a, a, an initiative called the Utility of the future with the idea that the old paradigm of simply needing a permit, while it's very important, it doesn't go far enough and that we can we need to work together to be um, environmental champions, reducing our carbon footprint, as I mentioned, increasing our resiliency and actually being a strong uh, 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 energy supplier to our communities as, as a backup. And, and also other things like community service, water reuse, water, water uh, consumption reductions, et cetera. So right, thus far, we have 175 water utilities across the country to join this Utility of the Future initiative, most of the larger cities in the country. And we hope ultimately that it'll, it'll expand to increase to the entire water sector so that it'll become uh, the rule, not the exception across the nation. Uh, so thanks once again for the opportunity to participate. I'm looking forward to working with our panelists and listening to questions and answers. Thank you very, thank you very much, Andrew Clark, and fascinating answer. So many things we can go on, but let, let us uh, return to His Excellency. Question about the uh, UAE tw Energy Strategy 2050. It sets a goal of using 12% clean coal. Can you tell us about the UAE's plans to use car ca carbon capture technology? Uh, I will refer to the statement uh, of uh, Dr. Dahlia. So Dr. Dahlia mentioned in, in, uh, that we cannot rely entirely on clean energy. And this is a fact. You, you need uh, a diverse mix of, of electricity sources. So this is a fact. And also Dr. Dahlia mentioned that uh, technological advancement is key to mitigate uh, climate change. And here on, on uh, technological advancement, I will highlight uh, the efficiency increase when it comes to coal plant, when it comes to uh, gas turbines, this is key. The other thing is the technological advancement when it comes to carbon captures. Here in UAE, we have all the ingredients to have a successful uh, 
mix combination of uh, system uh, uh, power generation system that is based on coal or based on gas combined together with the carbon capture that uh, can be utilized for our enhanced oil, oil recovery so this is how we look at it so clean coal uh, we can have it because it supports our needs for base load. And also we can uh, have plans to mitigate the carbon emissions by having carbon capture. Thank you very much, Excellency. The, um, turning to Dr. Dr. Dalian now, now, in your previous question, you were talking a bit about the, this innovations and the things that are really moving forward with, your, um, with the offshore wind plants, et cetera. Uh, two of the in industries where you have to design, design business strategies are aviation and power. You talk about how clean technologies are changing these industries and perhaps uh, the impact it's having on price. We've already seen His Excellency talking significantly about the massive cost reductions in solar, seen it in offshore wind, I'm sure as well, about how this all comes together. Sure, thank you. So on, on aviation, um, you know, bringing efficient technologies is something that we place as highest priority. We see a strong role uh, in what we call the future of flight. Uh, which will be led by how the aviation industry emerges from the current cycle um, and how it innovates to improve sustainably and efficiently. And we've been among the leaders of an ambitious aviation industry initiative to achieve 50% reduction in net CO2 emissions by 2050 relative to 2005 uh, levels. Um, and we've consistently been investing in new technology around a billion dollars annually, focused on continuously improving engine efficiency, developing new materials, um, and engine architectures that are fundamental to lowering fuel consumption and reducing noise and emissions. The GE 9X is, is actually a good example. This engine will provide customers with 10% better fuel burn than the current GE 90 engine. Um, it is the world's largest and most powerful commercial jet engine. Uh, it incorporates over 300 3D printed parts, which uh, helps it to reduce weight and increase efficiency. We're also currently testing the uh, GE Catalyst turboprop engine, which achieves 15% less fuel consumption than its predecessors. Um, and we're actually working on hybrid electric propulsion, which hopefully uh, will help make commercial electric flight a future reality. Now, it's not just the engine technology that we look at. We're also looking at ways to make the existing fleet more fuel efficient um, with service technologies. For example, the GE's 360 foam wash which is basically an alternative to water washing. Um, the process involves injecting specially formulated proprietary solution that removes dust and dirt particles in the engine, which restores um, engine performance, leading to reductions in fuel uh, consumption. And G is actually working with Etihad as a launch partner as part of the Etihad Greenliner program, um, which in 2021 expects to realize significant fuel savings and a reduction of more than around 7,000 metric tons of CO2. Another important um, point that I'd like to highlight here is um, uh, continuous testing and deployment of biofuels. So there are now several possible sources of alternative sustainable jet fuels um, that have met rigorous safety standards and GS worked closely with industry airlines and global aviation regulators um, to demonstrate the use of sustainable aviation fuel within G aviation engines. And hopefully we'll see more scalability of biofuels and more traction in the, um, in the commercial market. Um, I think on the point of cost, I'd say, you know, cost efficiency overall um, has in fact, you know, been one of our primary considerations in R&D. And, uh, you know, you alluded to the Halide X, which uh, is the most powerful offshore wind turbine, um, and is also the most efficient. So with a leading capacity factor of 60-64%, uh, makes it a lot more cost effective and competitive. But one aspect I'd like to uh, highlight actually is the role of digitization. Um, as I believe it's also a key factor uh, in reducing cost and a key element of uh, the decarbonization of the power sector. Digital technologies can help coupling generation optimization with grid optimization uh, and a real-time understanding of demand. Um, and that would help system operators basically to be able to integrate and optimize dispatch of all the assets while considering the actual cost of each generation source and ensuring that um, you know, we're choosing the lowest carbon and the least cost generation solution. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Dalia. Just, just a question for our audience. Uh, feel free. We will have a bit of time at the end for questions. Just a little bit of time. If you have one or two sh um, short, sharp questions, they'll be most welcome here. Um, I will turn to Mr. Abramovitz. Um, 
fascinating what you, your talk about Burundi and other countries to build out. Can you tell us about what do you think uh, developing countries need to further encourage the deployment of advanced clean technologies? Okay, just before that, because I was inspired by Dr. Dahlia, you know, there's an Israeli startup here that does the electric plane, and I believe in three to five years, uh, the direct flights that we now have with UAE, could all be electric, uh, and that the charging will be done in each of our countries um, through renewables. So ha happy to try to make that introduction for you if, uh, if you're in the market for it. I think Africa needs two, two or three things that um, uh, we all could, 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 uh, could provide. The, um, I think a lot of the future of energy for Africa, there are 600 million people without power. There's two to 300 million burning uh, heavy fuel oil and the population is going to double, right? And so one of the things they need is positive examples. And I think part of the future of energy in Africa, uh, maybe GE does these, uh, you know, um, uh, grids, but imagine, imagine a regional grid. Let's lead by example, right? Like um, one of the ways to be able to increase the percentage of renewables is we can cover uh, the time zones. Um, in our in our region, from the Persian Gulf all the way over to us, and maybe the Maghreb and, and to Europe, I think I think this would be a positive example for civilization overall of the kind of cooperation that then can be replicated in places like Africa, where maybe you'll have some places that are more stable than others, where you can actually do a large part of the generation and bring it to places where there's there's um, greater energy poverty. So I'm I'm happy to. Um, you know, to talk about it and to plan it and for that to come out. But what's really needed in Sub-Saharan Africa, so as we have the technologies, we have the strategies, is we need resources. We need, we need resources to take the solutions that currently exist. We welcome all the innovations, but to be able to now replicate and scale. And again, I really want to in, in, invite the panelists and our countries to figure out how to, how to, how to do this um, in a savvy, uh, business-minded uh, way, we're, we're open to investments, not just us, but other other companies, we're open to um, collaboration. And in Africa, it's gonna be both on-grid and off-grid, and there's lots of new technologies here also on the, on the off-grid. And we heard from uh, Andrew before, it was also the nexus of energy and water, um, particularly in desert countries uh, in, in Africa. We're, we're, we're both countries that depend um, on our ability to also have fresh drinking water and desalinization is gonna play uh, a greater part. So I think first positive example of the kind of transformative cooperation like regional grids, and then deployment of additional resources for, you know, and to do it together because also, you know, there's a large Muslim population in um, places in the developing world. And some of those places, maybe it's a little bit harder for us to, to be able to deploy, but uh, the kind of partnership that brings together our innovation and our capital, uh, and certainly the goodwill that's um, now very public, would be, uh, would be most welcome. Thank you, Mr. Roberts. And you've touched on the, the, the water issue, which I think is a great link back into Andrew Kraken. So thank you very much for that. Andrew, you've talked a bit about um, Hurricane Sandy, the impact of storms it doesn't really matter where you are in the world you will see the you will see the impact of resiliency having some impact on where you are for us in the us it might be more about hurricane sandy and katrina but other parts of the world will have your own storms are equivalent um, so you've touched a bit on this but i wonder if you think more you want to talk about on resiliency i mean ensuring access to clean water is clearly going to get tougher as the impacts of climate change increase what do we need to do to make our clean water supplies more resilient well, thank you. Um, I think that we have to be smarter. Um, I mean, we have to, uh, and I think there's there, there are two halves to it. One is that we have to um, ensure that we we get existing knowledge, disseminate existing knowledge to those who do not have it. So, in some instances, in in, in whether it be in the United States with uh, underserved communities, you know, less networked rural communities um, that they don't have access to knowledge that the the, lead, the leaders in in the, in the sector have to disseminate that information. You know, rapidly to those entities and, and globally the same, um, the, in, in, a, in the sense that there are many entities, uh, countries, uh, you know, people across the world that, that lack access to clean water and wastewater. And some of it is, is due to lack of knowledge, um, knowledge that the, that the leaders of the, uh, of the world already have, but it hasn't disseminated or trickled down, pardon the pun, to, uh, you know, the, 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 the every, every community, every sector. So dissemination of knowledge 
dissemination of best practices, dissemination of technology, um, which, which already exists. And then the second piece is, of course, you know, like Dr. Dahlia and His Excellency and Mr. Obama is leading the way with new technology that will, that will you know, strip the field ahead of us and, and, and solve the problem. So I think it's two factors, the, the leaders of technology that will you know, develop new, new programs, new practices, new technology to put everybody ahead, but then making sure that we disseminate the knowledge that exists and the new knowledge as it, it comes forth um, to every community across the, 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 the globe as quickly as possible. Because in many instances I've seen that when we work with uh, underserved communities, we see that, that there are things that, let's say the New Yorks and Chicago's and Los Angeles's of our country know and could easily be adapted to other entities, but they just aren't, um, you know, they, they don't have the resources to be at the cutting edge. So it, it's, it's critical to, 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 to accelerate the learning curve. So keep advancing our knowledge and then accelerate the learning curve. I think that is the critical thing. And then the last thing I'll say is that I think um, it's important to look to not be compartmentalized, to not look at water and energy as two compartmentalized entities, but see that there's a nexus between the two. So that, for example, uh, water, you know, water treatment plants can provide, like, for example, a wastewater treatment plant can reuse its water. I think of my colleagues in Singapore and how they're reusing every single drop of water is amazing. And that needs to be like sort of the, the leader and the example for the rest of, of the world. So, so, you know, reusing water can, re, you know, um, can, is, is, is critical, but we can reduce our en the energy costs of, of water treatment plants, the energy requirements, but also reduce the water um, requirements of energy systems by, you know, re water reuse and, and, and that sort of process. So the idea is, is to, to take advantage of the water energy nexus and look for opportunities to, to be multi, uh, multi-successful or, or uh, in, in, in these areas because there are synergistic opportunities. Thank you very much, Mr. Crichton. Fascinating, there's so many fascinating issues in many ways. I'm going to, uh, I'll, I'll go through a couple of the questions just quickly. So I'll first, I think the first question is most suited to the, His Excellency, but feel free anyone else who wants to come in. Uh, the UAE has a 25% clean energy target by the end of 2021. Would it be realistic to achieve this by the end of the year? Or is there plans to move the target back a year due to the uh, economic impacts of COVID-19? Uh, we, we already have uh, under construction, uh, mainly between under construction and uh, operation and projects, we already have 24%. Uh, and we are moving beyond that 24% and uh, we will hit the target and maybe beyond target of 50% by the year 2050. So UAE on target, uh, don't look only at the clean energy sources, also look at the other projects, innovative projects that we are doing. We did the carbon capture project, one of the first uh, in the world. We did, uh, we, are, uh, we have under construction, the waste to energy program, as I mentioned, 2 million ton of municipal waste that will be removed. Uh, so we, we have different, uh, different programs that we are working on. So in generation, in carbon reduction, and uh, demand side management, as I mentioned, it's, it's a big campaign, it's a big program that includes uh, creating awareness uh, about public, about the, the importance of uh, energy conservation, water conservation, educating people about it, uh, creating policies, uh, regulations that will uh, give incentives for people to be more uh, uh, cautious about consumption. One of the things that we're working on now is the green code uh, for, for buildings, for new buildings. So we want to set a benchmarks, benchmark for all the buildings that will, uh, will be built in the UAE to be more efficient when it comes to water and uh, energy consumption. So we're, we're doing a lot and uh, we have diverse tracks that we're working on. Wonderful, thank you very much, His Excellency. I think I might, um... Just add a little bit onto the end of that question and throw it open to everyone, because you just talked about the concept of reducing energy demand. There's another question on how do we go about the process of reducing demand? How do we educate people to use less energy or consume it more wisely? The build, green building standards, which you mentioned. Does anyone else have any views? I'm sure you probably all have views on this, this sort of issue. Um, look, we, we, we've just had a tough year um, and it was a year with the reduction in consumption. I mean, I, I think that the whole world has learned that we can do, we can do with less, right? And that um, and, and we can make changes in our lifestyle and our consumption. Um, 
and 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 that's that's and if we don't, the consequences are, are quite dire. So, so one is I, th I think we've all been humbled by um, nature um, when she's angry, and um, and we know we can do with less. The second is that we we do need to put I think a price on carbon. Um, there's different ways of doing it. If we don't do it all, of our manufacturing will be hurt because uh, the EU at some point very soon is going to say, if we look at the carbon footprint of all of our manufacturing, and if it wasn't made with a certain percentage of renewables in the, in the mix, it's going to be taxed. So we might as well price carbon at the source, um, which will also accelerate, uh, I think, the um, um, the adaptation of, of and, and will also force people to cut back on on, uh, on that. And with that, look, we have to talk about the electrification of transportation. Um, it's a different kind of cutting back, um, but uh, certainly, um, you know, our, our, our two countries are relatively small and the, the batteries are getting, you know, stronger and stronger. And if, you know, the, look at the prices that you guys have, I, I can't compete with your pricing on kilowatt hour. I'm, I'm deeply impressed and a little bit uh, envious, um, but it's still so much cheaper than, than burning um, fossil fuels for, for transportation. And then we'll, and soon we'll have a aviation. So I, th I think cutting back, I think putting a price um, price on carbon, uh, we'll, we'll need to do it anyway. We might as well do it out of love and not out of uh, fear. Um, and then the electrification of, of transportation can, can be very helpful. And the last thing I want to say, as a person of faith, uh, with um, all of our brothers and sisters, we probably have at least three monotheistic religions uh, here. Is, is the notion of a day of rest, right? I mean, um, on, on the seventh day, Allah, God, rested. And um, if we all took seriously our, our days of rest, not, maybe not even out of religious conviction, but out of the future for our children, we could cut the emissions by one-seventh starting this weekend. So may we all kind of live up to the glory of our traditions. Thanks, Yusuf. Andrew, maybe I want to, if, if you don't mind, maybe I say a few words around um, hydrogen and carbon capture, because I think they do play an important role. Um, and many countries today place high, high importance uh, on both. UAE actually, one of its strategic projects is to become a major hydrogen producer. Um, we can actually support the country's move towards hydrogen by enabling hydrogen blended fuels. We have over 400 gas turbines in the UAE. Um, and our BNE class turbines can run on 100% hydrogen. Our air derivatives can run on more than 90%. Our F class can run on 60% and H class up to 50%. And this can be accomplished either as a new build or as a retrofit. Um, so with relatively minor changes to the gas turbine. So even if a decision has been made to build a gas fired power plant today, the opportunity to switch it to a carbon free solution is still there. Um, I do want to mention that mixing hydrogen and natural gas at a 50-50 volume ratio does not result in a 50% reduction in CO2 emissions. So to achieve a 50% reduction in CO2 would require approximately 75 to 25 hydrogen natural gas mix because of the volume, uh, sorry, gas volume because of the lower density and energy of hydrogen. And I, and I think just, you know, um, again, on our earlier point around the um, drastic reduction in cost, I think for um, you know, technology breakthroughs and making hydrogen more cost competitive as a zero carbon dispatchable fuel source, policies and incentives uh, need to be put in place um, to help push that forward. And then on the carbon capture utilization and storage, you know, we, we see similar potential. Uh, we've been focusing on providing CCS technologies with its integration with gas turbines. Now, some of its drawbacks uh, is around increased upfront capex, additional space requirements and slight reduction in generation efficiency. So back to Yusuf's point, you know, a price on carbon could make this technology uh, an economic option, uh, even with the increase in LCOE. And again, targeted policies and incentives could be the game changer needed to cut costs and widely deploy CCS technologies. Uh, I, mean, I agree with all of uh, my esteemed panelists have said, and I, I would say that maybe it's a, a multi-pronged approach. I mean, first is, is Dr. Dahlia said to incentivize technology as much as possible so that we increase the total pie of knowledge that's available to the whole planet. And then second, to disseminate the existing and new knowledge as, as, as quickly and rapidly and efficiently as possible. Because it is really a shame 
but for the lack of existing knowledge some people are, are doing without energy, without basic services. And so, I mean, it's simply, a, I mean, it's one thing to discover something that is yet to be discovered, undis you know, that is undiscovered, but to, to disseminate knowledge that is already existing is, is within our capacity. And so we should make sure that everybody is up to speed in every community with what already knows and, and to, to, sort, to, to accelerate that learning curve. Also economic incentives for not only new technology, but for energy uh, you know, consumption reductions and, and conser conservation measures. And lastly, public education uh, to make sure that people um, know that, that, that they're in the fight too, that this really is, um, as Dr. Obama had said, the, the, it's a battle to save our planet uh, you know, in this century and for the future. So I think it's a, it's, it's, it's a com combination of incentives, economic dissemin uh, uh, knowledge dissemination and, and public education. Thank you all very much for your insights there. I, to be honest, I could happily talk to any of you for an hour about the topics which we've currently talked about and because they are all so fascinating, but unfortunately we are well over time. So I'd just like to say personally, uh, a huge thank you to His Excellency, Dr. Dahlia, Mr. Rowitz, Mr. Kraken, and I'll just pass it back to the Consul, Gen Consul General of the UAE to close out uh, today's session. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, everyone, uh, for joining us in this panel. You know, I before I close out, I actually, because we have like a few minutes before we have the next session at 2 p.m., which is hosted by the Israeli Consulate in New York, there are some questions that were asked uh, from the audience. I'm not sure if we, uh, you know, if anybody wants to respond to them, uh, we could obviously, uh, you could text them uh, the answers. Uh, but uh, I want to just say one more time, thank you, Andrew. Uh, the panelists and everyone in the audience for tuning in. Um, so I'd like to remind you again that the Israeli Council in New York will be hosting the next panel discussion today, uh, which is titled Women Leading Climate Action, um, people like Dr. Dahlia, at 2 p.m., after which the Australian Consulate in New York is hosting a discussion on food security at 4 p.m. You can find the registration links uh, that I put them down in the chat. Um, but uh, other than that, I just want to say thank you once again for joining. Thank you very much. It was an honor. All right. thank Goodbye. You for having thank you. Myself. Pleasure to meet you all too. Take care Bye and now. stay safe. Bye -bye. You Brooke and uh, our friends, you're invited for a technology solar tour. I can, certain things I can't say on the Zoom, but I'm happy to show you and then we'll host you for dinner as well. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you, thank you guys. Thank you. Take care, everyone.